A few months ago, we built our very own arcade machine, but a lot of you chimed in to tell us that throwing together something with off-the-shelf parts from well-known sources like Ultimark and North Coast Custom Arcades wasn't DIY enough. Okay, well, what if I told you that this was handmade, a truly DIY creation? Well, it is and we're gonna have a look at it. After I tell you about our sponsor, Mack Weldon. Mack Weldon believes in smart design, premium fabrics, and simple shopping. Use offer code TECHTIPS to get 20% off your next order at the link below. Okay, so even though it looks the part, the Carry 42 isn't really DIY so much as it is someone else's DIY project that turned into a product that he sent to us. And that someone is Lov Hulten, a Swedish artist who's handmade a huge selection of limited production retro gear. Some of this stuff is incredible, and he's even made PC cases. So the Carry 42 though, is right up there with his most exciting and beautiful ideas. It's short for Carrier for Two, and ours, which was graciously loaned to us by Mr. Holton himself, features a mother of pearl inlay of Ms. and Mr. Pac-Man on the outer casing that's completely flush with the wood. It's entirely handcrafted from American walnut with a vintage retro aesthetic, and the craftsmanship on it is outstanding. Everything fits together with a level of precision rarely seen in wood for a commercial product anymore, and certainly with a higher level of precision than we ended up with in our own cabinet thanks to our amateur level assembly and having to move it around multiple times during construction. Speaking of which, the size comparison is absolutely staggering. Let's go for a tour of it. So even the control deck of our full-sized arcade machine dwarfs the Carry 42, but it includes all of the following a 12 inch 1024 by 768 display, twin 10 watt speakers, a humble Raspberry Pi running retro Pi with some preloaded customizations, a diminutive 16 gig USB flash drive that contains a handful of games of dubious legality, and a USB port to plug it into, allowing you then to add your own less dubious ROM files, should you please. While we're back here, you might notice that there are no fewer than two HDMI ports and six and a half millimeter headphone jacks. Well, essentially, these ones are outputs, these ones are inputs, and then inside the box are small patch cables that connect them for use with the included screen and speakers. So in theory, you could connect this up to an external display and a pair of headphones or even a TV and receiver for a much bigger picture and sound experience. Though in practice, not everything is as it seems. More on that later. Something you might have noticed missing back here is an obvious way to keep the lid upright while you're playing. And that's remedied with this here twisty pulley thing. Just grab it, pull it out, twist it, and it's locked in place. There are three separate angles you can prop it up at. I think the only thing that could make this thing more Swedish is a yellow and blue color scheme. I love it. But it isn't purely a piece of art, right? How about the gaming experience? Well, we got off to a pretty good start. The buttons and sticks are sharp and responsive. The speakers can get pretty loud, though they are clearer and sound better in general at lower volumes thanks to the box acting as kind of a wooden reverb chamber. But as for the screen, well, for starters, it's a TN screen with pretty terrible viewing angles, meaning that the two player experience is best enjoyed with a very close friend or romantic partner. And there's also some pretty severe motion blur that while it's something you can get used to, it's far from ideal, especially in shoot 'em ups. And this is all before we get to what was our biggest out of the box issue, the input latency. Now, thankfully, that was something that can be controlled to a small degree by entering the underlying emulator and making some configuration changes. However, these changes really should have been the default settings. While we're in here though, something else retro gamers might not appreciate is the blurry linear filtering effect enabled by default. It makes sense here since the screen isn't super high res and the stock effect is to curve the screen to match the bezel, 
and it might have even masked some of the ghosting a bit, but we personally preferred our approach where some clever shader work can make for a far cleaner, more appealing image that more closely resembles an old CRT. So once again, this problem was mostly solved. Bringing us to the one that we couldn't fix, the speakers. Remember that six and a half millimeter headphone jack? Well, that's not for the speakers. It's actually power for the LCD and the power LED, which we only discovered when we went to try plugging headphones in and got a loud buzzing in a blank screen. Oops. The speakers ended up being driven by HDMI, which would be fine, except that they were rewired for mono. Now some games, notably arcade games and 16-bit games, do actually run in stereo, and so does RetroPie by default, resulting in actually missing sound effects. After an also config tweak, our games at least had all of the sounds instead of just the left channel, but this is again something we felt could have been done better. With all of that said though, these are problems that are probably only going to bother purists, bringing us back to the real reason the Carry 42 exists. To be an artistic piece for retro gaming enthusiasts and collectors. And if we look at it through that lens, even though it's not perfect, it does work out of the box and casual gamers likely wouldn't notice anything was wrong. Now that doesn't translate into a recommendation that you go out and buy one of these, especially considering that it's powered by a Pi and the asking price for a base unit without the inlay is 2,599 euro plus VAT. But if you're the kind of person who just straight up doesn't give a crap about money, and I know you guys are out there, there are only 50 of them in the world, and Mr. Hilton's craftsmanship is something that cannot be denied here. And that beauty and scarcity is what you're really paying for here. Not the hardware and software, which by the way, we would love to be consulted on next time. Speaking of being consulted ahead of time, TunnelBear VPN has really gone off the rails on these integration reads. I love these guys. Have you ever been camping and thought, I really hope I'm not gonna get attacked by bears? Well, of course you haven't. Who goes camping who's watching this channel? Wait, How are you supposed to set up a land party in the woods? But let's say you were going camping and you did. Well, good news. Bears aren't actually aggressive by nature. Black bears tend to run away from threats and hide in trees. Brown bears, on the other hand, can be aggressive, but that's as a last resort if they feel like they can't escape. So don't poke bears. Don't try to hug them or take selfies with them. They hate that. Interestingly though, some bears like to protect your online privacy. In fact, tunnel bears like protecting privacy so much they can be found in over 20 countries worldwide, working their way through firewalls, getting around censorship, and helping people enjoy a more open internet. Get your own tunnel bear for free at tunnelbear.com LTT. So thanks for watching guys. If this video sucked, you know what to do. But if it was awesome, get subscribed, hit the like button, or check out the link to where to buy the stuff we featured in the video description. Also linked down there is our merch store, which has cool shirts like this one, and our community forum, which you should totally join.